Hi everybody, thanks for joining. Let's see if we're live here. All right, we are live. All right. Another meetup segment, disrupting healthcare while creating a social impact. All right. Th this is a collection of different topics that I was covering during meetups. Um, in 2018, traveling back and forth between Philadelphia and Dallas, Texas. Right. One of the topics that I covered, right, comments are open. One of the topics that I covered was the report to the president in 2017. Uh, it's about the DSP workforce crisis. Again, um, the staff, the actual staff of home care agencies have been getting paid close to nothing for many years, even though the type of work that they're doing um, is very valuable. Um, it, it saves governments money um, from, them, from people being in institutions that need 24 hour care um, and uh, home care services allow that to be done uh, in a community setting um, at a fraction of the cost. Right. So the money is there, uh, but th there are certain legislation or approaches that or capitalistic type approaches that most home care agencies have been taking through the years that have been really um, been hurting the overall industry. And it not only affects the people that need the services, it also affects the families, communities, and as well as the U.S. economy, because with more and more people getting paid close to nothing, they must depend on government subsidies. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, why it's been like this for so long, but me personally, I think it's backwards. All right. And this is really a report to the president, as you can see here. And these are the main problems. Uh, it's turnover, uh, the fact that the industry is growing. So with turnover and the growing industry really doesn't match up um, properly. It, it leads to disaster, uh, which are the effects of the workforce crisis because more and more um, agencies must focus on rehiring and retraining and not only hurts their bottom line, it also uh, again, it, ha it affects the families and also the consumer that needs the services or the person needing the services. Uh, I, I actually came across this report um, maybe, I believe it was 2018 when I, when I came across it. And uh, this, is, this is way after we already launched the DSP-123 in the Philadelphia area. Uh, for the general public, allowing families and um, those in, in the Philadelphia area to um, earn more per hour of their time. Um, as far as uh, this report, it is outlining what, um, what they believe are, are the best ways to um, help DSPs stay in the industry longer and want to continue to provide services um, to those with intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities. But as outlined in, in this report, uh, the direct support workforce is one of the highest, highest in demand in the US. As far as the next 10 to 20 years, DSPs is the number one job that's needed in the next 10 to 20 years, I would say the next 50 years. And uh, from my perspective, I felt that um, because of the ongoing turnover and because existing agencies really um, aren't able to see the uh, 50,000 50, foot overview of everything that's going wrong, no one really wanted to solve such a, such a big problem. Uh, m when I started to survey, um, 
HR managers of different agencies, most of their responses were, hey, this is this been going on for so long, nothing is going to change. Um, it's because they don't they're not they don't have that inside of technology, the benefits of technology, um, the benefits of of actually um, giving a, a staff member uh, a living wage, um, how they can actually help help the agency. So um, from from that type of survey, I, I did learn a lot. As far as DSP wages, it's still about ten to eleven dollars per hour. Um, again, these are um, some of these with this type of rate. Um, they're definitely uh, an employee. Uh, the average DSP wage uh, is below the federal poverty level for a family of four. Half of DSPs relying on government funded and, mean, and means tested benefits. Like I was saying. Most DSPs work two to three jobs or working overtime, which leads to burnout. Um, the average annual DSP turnover rates of 45%. It's actually more than that. I think it actually jumped up to about 80% and went back down to about 60%. The average vacancy rates are about 9%. And a quick way to check is what I used to do all the time. Just look up direct support professional. Indeed. And let's see. All right. So, and indeed, there are 2,907 jobs available for direct support professionals. That means someone, some agency is paying someone overtime if they already have the service um, or already have the referral uh, to provide the service. So they need someone to, to be in place until they find a replacement. Uh, so uh, most agencies, if they already have the referral in place, all they're looking for is another body, all right? Uh, and so in, as far as Pennsylvania goes, they actually did um, increase rates so so providers can pay um, their staff more. Right? So it should be between 12 and thir uh, 13 per hour. Uh, the overall goal, yes, it is to get them to $18 or more per hour. And that's really what the DSP123 um, give, gives them. It gives them that opportunity to earn and jump from 15 to 18 dollars um, or even more much faster all right so these are all job openings for dsps the problem is when you have a dsp again they get burnt out they're constantly being um have to engage and it, it uses a lot of brain power to be honest and uh, and so what this report is outlining is um, they kind of briefly talk about in their recommendations um, ways to upskill or uh, ways to continue to educate um, the staff, but they don't really talk about ways to you know give these DSPs opportunities to really become uh, create a career for themselves or. Um, you know, maybe go uh, have some type of educational system in place that uh, give them a chance to um, get a career as a as a clinician or a therapist. Um, the current programs in place is again they're only focused on replacing bodies, not really thinking about the long term um, effects or opportunities for the actual people that provide the service. Without DSPs, you just have agencies. Um, the DSPs actually provide the work. Uh, everybody else are just um, in existing agencies. They're they're just um, there to support uh, the DSP in providing the better service. Uh, unfortunately, there's many that based on each state. Uh, 
you have legislation or in some states you have uh, associations that um, are looking to um, continue to um, keep DSPs uh, at this low rate. They, it looks like they, it seems like they are interested in helping them increase their wages, but really don't have solutions in place. Uh, recently, um, for those that do live in, uh, before you could um, pay pay a staff member um, just a set rate for an entire weekend, uh, but now you must pay them overtime, which is great because I believe a lot of agencies were getting over paying people a set rate uh, for the day of service, maybe a hundred dollars. And, um, again, they're more profitable, but at the end of the day, the, the DSP is unable to really, um, earn more per hour of their time. And something like that is being more relevant. Um, now that you have on demand services like a DoorDash or, um, or a Uber, most, most people are willing to take the easy route and, um, just turn on their phone and, and be able to provide a service and turn it off. Right? So there needs to be a shift in the overall offering in order for this type of uh, service to continue on for the many years, the 40, 50 years to come. And um, I recognize such a problem early on uh, because I had turnover in my agency um, and many staff would leave the workplace and I went, wanted to really figure out what, why they were leaving, um, what what systems we had in place, um, what incentives we could offer them. Um, and I was able to come up with a solution that not only keeps them around, but excited about what's to come. And that's the DSP-123. I'll also add this link in the comments to this document. I wanted to show what is a DSP, all right? So as far as a, uh, what is a DSP, a direct support professional, they're not just a home health aide. They must have skills in different areas in order to properly support uh, the person with all types of needs. And that's really um, why I, I focus on um, helping clinicians start start their own agency, because you, you have that expert um, insight uh, to really help the DSPs excel in, in, in the services that they offer, as you can see here. Physical therapists, occupational therapists, nurses, dietitian, a personal trainer, counselor, psychologist, uh, the DSP uh, is that interdisciplinary uh, professional, right? But in today's age, you have the DSP that's working in these agencies and really don't have that um, mentorship to really provide a better service. So as a result, even though they're supposed to have all these qualities, they really don't they, re they, re they really aren't able to offer all of these. They're pretty much just maybe a chauffeur and a, probably a little bit of a teacher. Okay. All right, so one of the things that this report uh, covers and what they do like is uh, what New York tried to implement. And I believe they do have the instance of this still in place. It's a career gear, gear up credential model and framework where you move up um, after a certain amount of hours. So you have a DSP step one, step two, step three, supervisor management. As far as the autonomy's DSP one, two, three, we're looking to get you from here to here in about a six month period. Right? So you, you start training, and you get that on the job training as well with the mentorship as well from you all the clinicians or the clinical network they're able to provide services uh, get that experience but at the same time 
they have the tool and the autonomy application to complete tasks as if they were a supervisor or manager. So there's less of a delay for them to learn and start to earn more. As far as uh, the dependence on the DSP, the DSP is under a lot of stress when they're providing services. And so, because uh, if, if they do something wrong, the actual consumer of service can actually end up in a hospital or back in an institution where the, now the provider has no services to provide. So for that, there's, there's a lot of weight on the DSP shoulders to continue to provide services um, the right way. And, uh, so this is actually a good paragraph, the DSP workforce and the U.S. economy. The, D the direct support workforce promotes participation in the U.S. economy in two ways by helping people with an ID, with an I intellectual disability get jobs, and by enabling family members to work. Uh, there's an AARP article out there where um, on average, family workers lose about $500 million per year. It's more than Walmart, um, I believe they said Amazon at the time, um, but they lose so many hours of work uh, trying to support their family members. And of course you would want to support your family member if you could, but if you're able to do it in a much much efficient, much more efficient way, I'll definitely jump on that. Uh, so um, as far as autonomy, the mobile application, it allows family members to save on uh, planning, save on knowing how to provide a better service, and also give them the opportunity to tap into uh, the provider network to, to pay out of pocket uh, for services for respite if needed. Right. Uh, as far as the DSP and their skill sets, I usually talk about DSP skill sets and expertise along the lines of nursing assistance, not a personal care aide or a home health aide, um, because they must uh, know how to intervene uh, when certain behaviors occur, which is very important. If you don't really know how to recognize um, specific behaviors that could be in an individual support plan, then you're considered just an aide or um, someone to just provide custodial type services. Okay. So with autonomy, we're giving them the tools and training um, to be able to provide nursing assistant type skills or supervisory type skills or manager type skills. Uh, uh, this report is very detailed, and it really gets gets you to understand the the amount of loss or waste that's going on in healthcare. Uh, the cost of replacing a DSP for for developmental or ID services have been reported to be between two thousand four hundred thirteen dollars and five thousand two hundred dollars. So if you want to uh, put, put um, a number on the amount of money that's currently being wasted right now, right? so this is just based on 2,907 openings. So that's how much money is being wasted right now, right? $7 million. And that's on the low end if they're, if they, if it, if they're paying $2,500 to replace. And so uh, again, early on, I, I I did recognize that a lot of money was being wasted to recruit, retrain, and rehire. Uh, so a, a, a system needed to be in place 
uh, other than a Relias Learning um, or a Care Academy. So these types of trainings, um, they are fee focused and it doesn't give the, the, the general public an opportunity to learn and train on their own. Um, everything costs a fee, cost, cost money. Everybody's trying to get a piece of the pie. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, the consumer is suffering. Right? And, uh, and it contributes to this because so many people want to get a piece of the pie. You have administrative people, you have now new softwares that think that they're being more efficient, but they are, they do help, um, but they do cost, right? So in 20, 2015, it is saying that in total across the U.S., well, it just says in New York State alone, <laughs> it's $79 million, all right? Nationally, over $2 billion, right? $2 billion, right? So there's a huge need to try to figure out a way to replace DSPs when someone leaves the workplace. Because currently, existing agencies maybe have a trainer, HR director, um, some type of supervisor to make sure that they're trained based on uh, the ISP. Everyone costs money, right? So it really gets in the way. All right, uh, to wrap up, let me. All right, so as far as the autonomy application, uh, it's free to the general public. Right? And we create a pool of staff. Right? We create a pool of staff by training the general public, giving everybody an opportunity to be upskilled or to learn how to care for their loved ones. Right? Right. And so with these trainings in here, we're giving them the opportunity to earn more per hour out of the gate. They're in control. Right? So it's a way that we're assessing the overall pool and the overall people that are interested in working and being able to, to see ahead of time uh, their assertiveness or um, ability to complete tasks without supervision, which is very important. Um, without such a solution, you're gonna, you're gonna be um, hiring um, using the traditional model. You'll be posting to Indeed, you'll be waiting for someone to actually respond to your post, and then you need someone to actually review those resumes. Um, and then based on those reviews, do some type of follow-up and things along those lines. So we flipped the model or shift, shifted the model, or some people might call it we're disrupting the model um, in order to um, not only increase their wages, but give them more opportunities. As they progress through our DSP-123, they're introduced to um, more and more training opportunities not just in healthcare, but in real estate, technology, um, uh, as well as as well as healthcare. So um, these are all in-demand jobs for many years to come. Right. right so Relias Learning, Care Academy, um, all these different types of training solutions, they just get get existing agencies to just enough. Um, training in place. But at the end of the day, there's always going to be um, specific training based on the individual support plan. All right. Uh, one way we're taking it a step further is we have on site orientation, where the on site orientation is actually um, connected to our sensors. That way, especially in a 24 hour facility or home, we're able to make sure our staff um, are in the right place at the right time um, so that there's no type of allegation of neglect uh, or abuse, right? 
So this is an example of the on-site orientation where um, it's specific to each consumer of service. And that way we now have a set up once, train many times model where currently uh, every time you set someone new up or a new consumer, you have to train them again and again and again. And that's where this expense coming at, this expense, because the current model is, all right, we have a new, we need a new staff person, let's put them through Relias. Okay, but we still need to train them further on the ISP, or we need to train them on specific policies and procedures, all right? Um, our goal in autonomy is to automate that entire process where you're involved as the CEO um, in the specific areas once the system is able to assess that they're a good candidate to go out into the field, that, that is when you do your interview, not before that. We wanna eliminate any cost before hire, and we wanna make sure that those that are onboarding to provide the service, they at least meet the minimum uh, standard requirements before you even talk to them. All right. So I think that's actually a pretty good lunch and learn for today. I'll uh, I'll follow up on this next week. We're currently at page 21. I'll also add this to the comments. So if anybody has any questions for next week, I'll follow up on these, All right? All right, thanks for joining everybody. Have a good rest of your day.